Done. Take two, honey. You're directing. Ready? <laughs> I'm Tammy Lynn Michaels, and you're listening to You Might Know Her From with Damien and Amy. Damien. And guess what day it is? What day is it? It's International Lesbian Day. <gasps> Happy Lesbian Day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I feel like it's an important day. There's also, I think, International Lesbian Visibility Day. There's lots of holidays that are sort of meaningless, but I felt like I was excited when I learned it this morning. So we are a week away now when you're listening to this, folks, yeah. from International Lesbian Day. We're also in, is it Queer History Month? Is it LGBTQ History Month? Or is it just Gay History Month? It is LGBT History Month. That's how the United States has branded it. Okay, well, it's not for me then, because I identify as queer. (laughs) (laughs) Get out. You're not part of this celebration. You're going to get another month. Maybe there's a Queer History Month. I'm very into the fact that they, we're going to call it LGBTQ History Month. We're calling it that. Hello. Welcome to another episode of You Might Know Her From. With Damien and Anne. I am Damien Queer Identified. I'm Ann, queer, lesbian, identified. Yeah, you can be both. I also uh, identify as a a gay man um, in in certain scenarios, but my politics, I feel like I'm a queer person. Yes, I agree with that. And I think it's, you know what, it's been an interesting, you know, it's like been an evolving thing, which I think is also okay and also good. That's why we're adding the Q to LGBTQ History Month. Also, I'm very into the fact that they're calling it October. Do you know, because I feel like Halloween is an important queer holiday. So I'm glad that it falls in the month of October. While we're on the topic of Lesbian History Month, can you tell me like what do you think about I know how you feel about Halloween but do you like I know gay quote unquote gay men like yeah. Halloween I find that a little bit to be a lot but I also I love Halloween so Same. I am a part of it do you feel like lesbians like if we're you know talking I generally think the witchy, I think the witchy crystal culture part of like horoscopy pentagony like version <laughs> of lesbians are very into Halloween I think it maybe. Culturally speaking, I feel like I am a like Halloween lesbian, but I don't know how other lesbians feel about it. But I do think that like aesthetically, October works for lesbians in a lot of ways. And whether or not that's like hiking aesthetic or like sort of like building aesthetic, I don't know. I think it's like a witchy. I, I think lesbians identify with witches as well. So I'm going to say it's a good queer month for all of us. Something that we talk about in this episode to come is about the inner workings and webs, if you will, of lesbians and lesbians in Hollywood, so lesbians, pop culture, whatever you want to call it, that there's this sort of, I think it exists in queer culture because it's already a niche community, but it's obviously like there's this joke of it within like the lesbian community. Right, sort of that lesbians keep all of their exes in their lives and that all of their friends are their exes and all of their exes are their friends. So it creates like even more of an, an interrelated web. But Hollywood is also a niche community. So it's just like gets even darker and stranger when you start exploring those depths. If you're an L Word fan, you know about the chart where the show sort of like wove all of the characters together, like whoever slept with who Damien and I took it upon ourselves to create a lesbian L word version of the chart where we connected all Hollywood lesbians back to people that had been on the show yes and so it was like anyone who was a writer director cameo appearance or star actor whatever on the show and then it was like built out from there folks we got I think we talked about this on an episode, so hopefully I'm repeating the exact same thing I said. (laughs) But we got a Pulitzer Prize winner on our chart. We have an Oscar winner on our... Multiple Oscar winners because Angelina Jolie is connected to the L word through her relationship with, like, Jenny Shimizu, who then also, like, I don't know, slept with somebody else on the show. Guinevere Turner! (laughs) Right, who was a writer and actor on the show. And then, like, we got Alice Walker on the chart because Mm -hmm. she was in a relationship with... Tracy Chapman, Chapman, who was also in a relationship with (laughs) Guinevere Turner, former guest, if you might know her from and super connector. But look, we've also got the likes of, excuse me, Whitney Houston on the chart, Jodie Foster, Foster. Ellen Portia, Jane Lynch. The list is super expansive. And we've even, you know, for us, it's hard for us to deal with young people, but we've even got young people on the chart. You know what I mean? (laughs) Did you hear that? Did you hear that Carola Delevingne and Ashley Benson might be back together? I'm over it. I'm over Ashley Benson. Cara Delevingne is a star as far as I'm concerned. I've talked about it on this before, but I really, 
am into Cara Delevingne. It took me like four years to get on board. I've never seen anything she's ever acted in, and I do not care. I'm very into her. Shout out to Katie Doherty, who I'm sure loves Ashley Benson. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, just like a like a an uninteresting blonde. <laughs> Love you. So this week's episode of You Might Know Who From is some, it's very exciting, and I feel like knowledge of what the chart is, and also knowledge of our own chart, which we're going to post on our Instagrams and maybe our Twitters as well. We'll both post it. We always are talking about well, who's going to post what. We'll both post the chart on our Instagrams the day this episode comes out. So go to our Instagrams right now. Follow us if you aren't, and then look at this chart so you can follow along as we show it to who Ian Tammy Lynn. Michaels, excuse me, one of the like earliest out actresses post her popular career. She came out once she was in a relationship with Melissa Etheridge, who's like one of the most famous lesbians. She's, of course, on the chart as well. They were sort of power lesbians in the early to mid 2000s. So it was really exciting to get to talk to her and then also present her with the chart. So we shared screens, we walked her through it, and you're gonna hear all of that. It was really wild to watch it happen in real time. And she played along, which was great. You might know her from Popular, The L Word, Committed, That 80s Show, and Dolly Parton's Heartstrings. I'm coming in real hot. We are fucking so excited to be here with someone that we've been courting for a long time that we were hoping to land when we were in LA and it never happened. But here we are on Zoom with actress and lesbian legend, Tammy Lynn Michaels. (laughs) (laughs) Tammy's waiting for the roar of the crowd. We're going to insert that. I did. I was waiting for them to all quiet down. I didn't know if you could hear me over them. Tammy, welcome to the show. Hi. 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 It's so good to see you. Thank you for joining us. You look fantastic. Oh, my God. You're so sweet. It's, you know, it's mascara, brush your teeth, put it together. We're just going to dive right in here because you appear in one of our favorite shows of all time, and that is The L Word. Okay. (laughs) Tammy, you played Lacey Haraway, a crazy ex-girlfriend of resident Lothario Shane McCutcheon. After receiving Shane's cold shoulder, your character starts a campaign to ruin Shane's reputation. You take paparazzi-style photos of Shane, calling for all the lesbians of L.A. to stop the menace, and describe her behavior as pathological with the four Fs. I don't know if you remember this. Shane finds them, feels them, fucks them, and forgets them. Forgets them. Oh, my God, yes, she does. (laughs) Then you fuck her one last time. Right. Whatever. I feel like your character was basically exposition for Shane. Like you were laying the groundwork for sort of what kind of character Shane was. In 2004, The L Word premiered. You were already one of the few out lesbian actresses working in Hollywood. So can you talk a little bit about how The L Word landed in your lap? And if you were versed in the world of Eileen Shaken? (laughs) We had some friends in common. Eileen Shaken and myself and my roommate at the time and then she's at one of these fam at one of these friend gatherings she was sitting next to me and they were talking about this project she was putting together and then maybe like a month or two later Eileen called me at home and said hey come on you want to do this thing and I said sure she said well we only have something for you in the pilot but if you're open Can we do a few more? And and at the time, I was like, yeah, that's fine. It was a phenomenal time. It was really strange because most I'd spent my time sort of on a set closeted. It is a whole different way of walking through life when you're closeted. And so to be like back on a set, (laughs) not only not closeted anymore, but like doing the L word too. And it was, it was just like upside down. It was like these anchors were sort of gone and I could sort of just skip through the set being who I was and not worrying about anything, any sort of like consequence in my career in the long run that I was doing this. Do you know what I mean? And I felt at the time that it was something important, you know? So from the beginning, I thought, oh, this is, everybody's ready for this. This is what everybody is ready for. That whole like lesbian map of like this person sleeping with that person. I was like, girl, finally, let's let's get real. That's how it is. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was fantastic. 
as a as a lesbian and and the thing is before i did the hollywood thing i worked at henrietta hudson's and ruby fruit what i did i did i was a cocktail waitress at henrietta hudson's okay oh my god it's true i may have lied about my age for a period of time to legally have the job but you know what cash is cash and a girl needs money and then, of course, I dated one of, like, the hot bartenders. <laughs> because that's what you do. And then, of course, I lied about my bartending experience to get the job at Ruby Fruit. <laughs> so then I did Ruby Fruits on Wednesday and Thursday. And Thursday, my friend Wendy would come in and her piano man, Tony, and they fucking get that place jamming and I get up on the bar and like we're dancing and we had such a good time and then I booked this commercial and my manager was like could you simmer down and climb in the closet and I was like oh girl there's so many people that have seen me dancing in this closet here I don't even know how you're gonna <laughs> shove me back were you out to your management team and your agent like they knew you were a lesbian but they were like you know what just get it together Yes, it's a the I thought I was moving to New York to like totally be something huge, bigger, better. And what I did was get into therapy. You know, I was raised Catholic and I had a lot of things to struggle with and uh, life got very real for me. And within that time of sort of settling into who I am without these other authority figures, parental figures, religious figures, sort of pushing on who I should be without that. I, I just thought, God, I can't lie about this. You know, I'm trying to make peace with this part of me and to then try to be ashamed of it and shove myself in the closet. It wasn't working for me. It really wasn't working. So the balance I found at the time was I will tell people that are in my life. I can't, I can't sit across from you and have dinner with you and lie to your face. I can't do that. I don't, it just, it's not in me. So my family back in Indiana knew I was out and you know what else? I was also the freaky cousin who was like, and don't tell anybody. <laughs> so I'm like, accept me because I'm gay, but shh, quiet. <laughs> like it was just, it was just, it was the weirdest life to try to live. And my girlfriend at the time, most of my girlfriends, they didn't really care if I was closeted. They really didn't. And meaning they didn't care if it, it caused any imbalance within myself. They wanted me to stay in. If that's going to bring you money, that's going to get us, whatever, be quiet. And they were like, that's fine. And there was another actor. I was ready to beard with him. That obviously fell through. Was that set up by your team? No, that was set up from a friend of mine through Henrietta's who was like, oh, my God, I got a friend. He's so amazing, but he's so closeted. Could you could maybe you guys get together? It w I mean, it was a whole thing. And it felt that juggle of I need to be who I am, but not these times. I, I don't like to compartmentalize. I grew up compartmentalizing t and it was detrimental. So all of this stuff that I was sort of unwinding and untangling in therapy, it was like living a closeted life was like going to force me to engage in all of this dysfunction again. And it really, it really was a trip. So yeah, they, they all wanted me to stay quiet. I mean, you, you were in a very public relationship at that time. And I feel like you know, we hadn't seen you play gay. You came out very publicly. Were you excited <laughs> to be playing a lesbian? Um, Were you hesitant to be like, I don't want to just be thought of as yeah. being a lesbian who then can only play lesbians? Right. That's, that's, that's exactly. I loved that my first character was Nicole. Mm, she couldn't get enough of those men. Arr, arr. Like, I love that. That was, and I was so afraid that I become, oh, oh, you have a gay role. You know who you should get for that. Like, I didn't want to turn into like the go to. Mm. I had hesitation about that. And, you know, I had hesitation after I got into that, my high profile relationship. I had hesitation because I thought, oh, I don't want people to think I'm writing her sort of fame or whatever. I, I really wanted to protect my career. And so I actually, I, forethought and gave it a break in my career to just let everything yeah everybody settle down that's right 
That's right, Nicole's a big lesbian, simmer down. And I let it just, and then when Eileen came and she was like friends of, of some really good friends and this thing, I thought, why not? If nothing else, it's going to be fun. And, you know, it was a great experience. So it was very different. Timmy, do you feel like every lesbian in Hollywood is connected a la the chart from the L word? Do you feel like that rings true? Uh, probably to some degree. I mean, yeah. And there's and there's probably like a VIP chart somewhere where shit connects too. Mm. Okay, let me just tell you what we've done. Tammy, I'm going to share my screen. This is what <laughs> Damien and I do in our spare time. Truly. Okay, oh so God. Tammy, take a look at this chart. You You said somebody may have created a VIP chart. That's exactly what we've done. What we've done is we've started to try to connect every person that's been on or affiliated with the L word. We've tried to connect every single one of their relationships that has public knowledge Uh back to the cast. So it's not every lesbian in Hollywood, but it's a lot of them because we're tracing them all back to people on the show. Absolutely. Let me get my glasses on here. Not sure that this is a question. We are just pleased with our (laughs) work. You'll see, you'll see Urbashi. that you're right. Okay, you'll I recognize see... Urbashi. Okay, okay, here you are right here. I don't know if you it's can see sure my cursor. Am. Look at that shit okay. right there. So we'll just, it, I just want you to take a look and see if you think there's any major players missing that are easily connected back to the L word that you're willing to share with us. Oh, shit. <laughs> <gasps> oh, gosh. Uh, not, not on a recording. Not on a recording, but whoa, I can, I, I know for a fact, just looking at this, that there's, there's going to be a couple missing. Okay, great. Uh-huh. Well, uh, that's, okay. that will one day when we meet in person without recording, you'll, t- you'll <laughs> give us the tea. I'm going to send you a copy of it and you can let us know offline. I am. I'm, I'm over at Jamie Babbitt right now, checking it out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we really went deep when we went to directors and writers on the show, right. you know? Oh, there's Lisa. And it's a work in progress. It's a work in progress, as you can see. So we have to redraw it at some point. Oh, y'all. Y'all, it's like... Thank you for indulging. That Mormon incest. Oh, it is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Oh, look at that. Oh! Wait, can you just tell us who you owed? Um... I put this online. This is not secret. This is all... About five o'clock from my name. That's all I'm going to say. Elizabeth Keener? I think you're talking about Kelly McGillis. (laughs) Here's my question. Here's my question. Some of those super secret VIP hookups. Look at that. Hookups. How did word of them get out at last until now? You know what I mean? Because there's some in there that I'm like, oh, yeah. Meaning like Hollywood lore that you knew that that happened, but it's not quite out. Yeah, you know what? There are some entertainers that are not closeted, but they're not necessarily out. Yeah. And maybe one day someone I'm thinking of will be more open about their personal life and that'll fill that up. That's beautiful. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm going to send you you a copy of that there. Thank you for entertaining us. Thank you for humoring oh, us. Guys, that must have taken so much work. It continues. Okay, Tammy, one of the roles that you're perhaps best known for is Nicole Julian on Ryan Murphy's first series, Popular, on the WB. Now, Popular only had two seasons, and sadly, the season two finale ultimately became the series finale. In that cliffhanger, you drunkenly drive over your best frenemy, Brooke. Right? Tammy, what do you think would have happened if that show was renewed for a third season? Do you know? Do you have any speculation? Can you say? There was talk of the third season having a lot to do with the trial of mm. me. And was it was it like vehicular homicide or <laughs> manslaughter or whatever? Was it is Brooke just scarred and has to wear like what? Like there were just so many ifs. And it Yeah. I couldn't believe it ended like that. I was like, Ooh. it's kind okay. of iconic that it's one of those like brilliant but canceled series, and then you are the catalyst for like the thing that happens. Yeah, the minute I read that script for the the pilot, the audition, I was like, holy shit! I have never been handed such delicious words in such order, and it was 
brilliant. It was so canceled too soon. Yeah. So Nicole's essentially the series villain and some of her storylines we just wanted to lay out here. So she's blackmailed by a male cheerleader meeting her birth mother. She's visited by ghosts of Christmas past, present and future. And then there's the manslaughter, of course. So Ryan Murphy's (laughs) made a career of raising the stakes to these sort of otherworldly spaces. Were there any storylines that you had on that show that made you feel like, oh, maybe this has gone too far? Well, I think when you put it in the context of Ryan Murphy's brain, nothing's too far. It all fit right in there. I mean, we lived for him coming to the set and going, guess what's going to happen in the next episode, ladies? We go, what? Like, he, you know, it was fun. So, I mean, everything pushed it. We had a fucking ottoman in the bathroom, you know? We had, like, like it was insane. So everything just seemed to push it, which was nice. Brian Murphy is very gay, and though it wasn't explicitly gay, popular had a very gay aesthetic, something that he has gone on to hone later on shows like Glee or yeah. American Horror Story or Feud or whatever. Can you talk about being a gay person on that set in the early 2000s? I mean, I think now it's like we think of Ryan Murphy and like we know what we're think- talking about, but then that was like a singular show and like the references were sp- so specific and so gay can you talk about that at all and like being a gay person in the early 2000s on that set see this harkens back to how hard it was to try to manage that that balance of i'm closeted i'm in here you know like i i was just trying my hardest I look back and the one regret, if there's such a thing to have, is that because I was closeted, I really had to suppress my own desire to celebrate that show. And we would go to the GLAAD Awards and I would like stand, I remember standing on stage that first year and we were accepting an award and everybody's clapping and we've got tears and inside I'm thinking, oh my God. I want to tell everybody I'm home. I'm with my people. Hey. And I like couldn't. I it I just found it to be so crushing. Everybody knew Ryan was gay. He does not pass. <laughs> he was so gay friendly and every storyline had some sort of shout out to some iconic female legend like it it was amazing and all I could think was like how much I would have loved to have had that show when I was in school and the episodes you know where like you know fucking Mr. Dawn turns into Ms. Debbie like we had just so many very important conversations within such a wacky context and I think it enabled a lot of people to open up and have more conversations about the alternative lifestyles. And it was, uh, I was really fortunate to be on that set because it was such a tender time for me. And I certainly wasn't getting from anybody on set, hey, if you're gay, shut up. You know what I mean? Like it was my own people. And I know that had I come out right then, it would have been to open arms. It was my own stuff. It was absolutely my own stuff that I, that I kept. Did you have any buddies on that set or people that you, if not confided in, at least like were your go-to people when you needed to sort of let loose some of that? Yes. Grossman. You know, she and I had every, like every love and scene together. And again, like I said earlier, I can't sit across from you and have lunch and lie to you. And I was having lunch with Leslie a lot and I couldn't do it. I I couldn't. So I had probably three people of the entire cast and crew and everybody that knew I had something that I was trying to hide. And, And they understood where I was coming from and why I was making the choice to be quiet about it. And then in the second season, somebody outed me which is at the very, very end. I think it was during the final episode and somebody was mad at me for something and they walked around set and outed me to the crew one by one by one. Wait, somebody Mm -hmm. on set outed you? And at that moment, I thought, I am never going to be fucking closeted again. I am never going to let somebody hold my sexuality over my head as a punishment And that was when I said I'm not, was at the very, very end of the second season. I was like, this is not going to happen ever again. 
Mm. Yeah. So I tell you what, it was a great set. There's always a a bad apple. And there was one bad apple. You can do. I'm sorry. This is maybe this is maybe too meta, but I feel like one of the sort of running tropes is that bullies and homophobic people are often gay themselves and sort of self-loathing. Do you think there's any version of the sort of closeted life that you were leading at that time that sort of you imbued Nicole with? Like that you funneled that energy that like maybe Nicole was gay and maybe, maybe that is why she was so nasty. Wow. That's interesting. I actually, I didn't play Nicole as one thing or the other. I played her as someone that had absolutely no problem pulling out the sexual card when we're, when we're playing games and she used it as her main card to be played. No. <laughs> no, okay. I was just checking. I was just checking. Was I was just checking. Was, was, it's not that deep. It's no, it's not was, that deep. But I was just wondering. The big thought. The person who was outing me on the set, I think they had their own stuff, which is why it was interesting that you then asked that question because I immediately swung it into yes, and then we were talking about Nicole, and I was like, wait. <laughs> oh, so I should have picked been, up on that. But yeah, I mean, that's probably exactly where that's coming from. Right. Right. And so I've 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 learned that when someone that you don't know that well has a real, I'll stay in the eye. When someone I don't know that well has a very strong reaction to me, my presence is triggering something in them that has nothing to do with me. And Mm -hmm. so that was something, you know, that you had to learn. Um, Nicole, I felt like Nicole just felt unloved and she was going to make everybody else feel that fucking way. Yeah. Yeah. She was angry. So, Tammy, Ryan Murphy clearly is, he's having more than a moment. I mean, he's been having a, <laughs> a, a, having a, sp- a, season. a span of, you know, successes and has this crazy deal with Netflix right now. Has there ever been any sort of talk of like a reboot or a reunion movie to wrap things up? Do you think that there's any version where that could happen? I don't see anything. Uh-uh. I, really? I, 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 yeah, he's got a lot of other things going on. He's got a lot of stuff going on. And it was 20 years ago and... I mean, when I look at stuff I did 20 years ago, I'm like, so I'm like, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. Oh, damn. You know, so like, who knows if maybe I don't know. But no, I I, I think it is just what that was. Okay, I could be wrong. I don't know everything. But okay, Tammy, you are a series regular on in the NBC midseason replacement committed. What was the biggest shift going from the WB to like an from an hour long dramedy to a major network like NBC. Oh my God. That was one of the best experiences. It was, you know, well, with the WB, you're standing next to a frog, right? You pose him. <laughs> There's that. And some people in my family, like back home, they were like, we don't even get the WB. So, you know, there's that. And then there's like fucking NBC. And you got Tom Poston standing next to you. And, you know, your grandparents think you finally legit because you're with Tom Poston. And it was surreal. And it was lovely. The, uh, the cast was amazing. And the crew was amazing. I, it was like a quick session in sitcom. You know, like I would sometimes just go to set and watch Tom Poston work through his scenes. Or I would go and watch like Jennifer and Josh because... I needed to learn like it was I hadn't like I went from like selling tampons <laughs> right or wait hold on I went from dancing on the bar at ruby fruit <laughs> to <laughs> selling tampons and pore strips and deodorant stuff and then like this popular thing and then w- in my relationship and then the NBC and it was all just very sort of large And exciting. It was kind of exciting. It was fun. I mean, when you're when you're an actress, like it's a dream. It's a dream mom schedule to have a sitcom. You work school friendly hours. You can drop off in the morning, pick up in the afternoon. The only late nights you have are the Thursday and the Friday. Like I was so happy when I got that. I could like still take care of my partner's kids and 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 go to work. I mean, the cancer came in the middle of that, which sucked. But, you know, it was the show itself was amazing. Were the craft services so much better at NBC than the WB? Okay, let me just say this. (laughs) 
the craft service was amazing. It was. But if you want to brag, the guy, and I don't even know his name, whoever did craft service the first season of Popular, that guy would come in with vats of homemade soup. He would come in with like sushi spreads left. And it was every day. And yes, on tape nights, NBC, the craft was unbelievable. So good. But shout out to that WB guy who was really going above and beyond. Dude, he's so his wife would come dragging in stuff she'd made at home. It was unbelievable. I thought there was such love. He and he was like this like total like surfer dude, like Hawaiian or something. It was amazing. Yeah. It's all about the fucking craft service guys. Dolly Parton's people. Bomb craft service. Yeah. Bomb. Oh, amazing. You set up our transition nicely. Okay. Okay, so after a 15-year break from film and television, you made somewhat of a comeback in Dolly Parton's Heartstrings for Netflix, which apparently has bomb craft services. I'm excited to hear about it. So your episode is called Cracker Jack, which is a song about a dog, but you play a lesbian jewelry designer who reunites with her three childhood best friends. They go on this weekend sort of like trip to the country. What about this project in particular made you want to return to the small screen? Dolly, I mean, Dolly Parton, what? Dolly Parton, they're, they're going to call you and say, come and read for this. You want to, oh, I'm so there. Dolly can call me from like the middle of my heart surgery. And I'd be like, be right there. You know, I got a phone call. Uh, uh, the casting director who was casting all of these things knew my wife from like 25 years ago or something. He called my wife one day and said, Oh my God, can you get Tammy? Can you get her? They want her, uh, you know, they, they want to see if she'll audition for this, blah, blah, blah. I, I think the director, um, this sounds so stupid saying, I think the director asked if they could get me. So she said, I want to see if we can get, you know, Tammy Lynn Michaels back and the casting and the, everybody's like, well, how? Like, how do we find her or whatever? And the casting guy's like, I know her wife. So it kind of came about like that. They sought you and, out kind of and I was like I, I was like over here like this scrubbing toilets <laughs> <laughs> and I was I'm like you know I was like a little you know because I'm I'm ready to come back and 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 work again because my kids are finally at the age but I hadn't like you know got my headshots done or done this or that and so they sought me out and I was like okay I guess I'll come play and, and it worked out amazing. It was amazing. Did it feel a little bit like you were coming out of retirement? Did it feel that way? It did. Oh, my gosh. So much has changed since I worked. Like, nobody checks the gate anymore. There used to be this whole, like, okay, that's great. Cut. Okay, that was good. Check the gate. Okay, wait a minute. Checking the gate. And then they would, like, look and make sure no hairs were in there or whatever. And they'd be like, okay, gate's clear. We'd be like, gate's clear. Moving on. Not anymore. They're like, cut. All right, so are we going to move on? Okay, that's great. Moving on. And, and it was so different that I... I, w I was so thrilled to be able to do this. Tammy Lynn Michaels, we have now entered the part of our show that we call Rapid Fire. This is Rapid Fire for us because we're just going to be throwing things at you with no segues, no transitions. But you can take your time. Don't feel too much heat. Okay, Tammy, you and your ex were featured on an episode of Kathy Griffin's reality show, My Life on the D-List, where Kathy is trying to become a political activist to fight Prop 8. So she consulted you and your ex based on your power lesbian status. <laughs> so that. can you say, what did it feel like to be in such a high-profile power couple, i.e. like Steven Spielberg went to your wedding, and what was the most power lesbian move that you ever pulled? I don't know if there's a way to explain to you or to impress upon you that what it's like, what that was like, had nothing to do with us. It had to do with how everybody else saw us. So that specific episode, I remember the twins were babies. Miller was like, wouldn't stop eating the cookie dough. And what that period of time for me was like was, am I present for my babies? 
Am I the mom to them that I need? Are they going to understand that all these other lights and all this other stuff is not as important? Mm. Is it time for them to take a nap? So I suppose it, it probably could have felt like a lot more if I was a different kind of person. You know, I've said it before, and I don't know if you can believe me, but when people sit and go, ooh, I can't wait to just, I can't, I'm going to get there. You know, I'm going to get there. I'm going to be there. That red carpet, the end of the red carpet, the parties with everybody in the house. That's, I'm going to get there. I'm going to be at that thing. And when you're there, you can't feel it because it's just your life. You can't feel what everybody else is pushing on you. You know, I mean, I suppose if you wanted to take that in, you could, but I have a hard time with celebrities that are impressed with them fucking selves because they're just famous for nothing. I, and, and you know what? Even if you are famous for something so, so I have a hard time finding respect for others when their respect that gets handed out is so conditional. And so hanging out with the Spielbergs and the Hamptons and all the people that go along with that stuff. It doesn't feel like anything except when you go to a friend's house and you're hanging out with all their family in the backyard. Yeah. It's, it's, it's literally, you don't, it, nothing about us was changing that was making us become the power thing. It, it was everybody's perspective sitting back. You know, they weren't home when I'm like wiping the vomit off the walls during chemo, but they'll, they're there when the, the big song comes out, you know, and, and, it's another way of trying to balance who am I really versus who do they think I am. Tammy, you appeared in Angela Robinson's short film, Debs, that ultimately became a full-length feature. Tammy Lynn Michaels, why the fuck weren't you in the feature version of Debs? It's, the short, in my opinion, is better. You're going to have to ask Angela. I'm not into it. <laughs> She's not coming on the show. <laughs> You're very um, good in it. And the yeah. movie is like the short. I, to me, the short is better. And I think you're very good in it. I loved it. And she came to me and said, I literally wrote this part for you. Please do this. And I was like, bitch, OK, I'm going to shoot it down. <laughs> All right. And then when it came time for the other one, you know how it, I hear it gets hard when the money starts flowing in and everybody's got an opinion. Yeah. So. Well, it's bullshit. It is, and maybe that was a little bit of like, no, we can't have a lesbian play that role type thing. Who knows? Probably was. But yeah, that was fun. Okay, Tammy, we've already referenced a few iconic lesbian bars in this interview, yeah. which is thrilling. But, you know, sadly, prior prior even to COVID, lesbian bars were dying out across the country. Right. It seems that you made one of your first moves on your ex at a lesbian bar in L.A. called That's Felt. True. True. So can you tell us what your favorite lesbian bar in the world was when you were a single woman and what your favorite lesbian bar is now? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have a favorite lesbian bar now because I'm in bed by 10. <laughs> but oh uh, yeah, you know what? I had a I still have a soft spot for Henrietta's. That was the first gay bar I went into. I was 19. I didn't do the math right. When they asked me what year I was born, I fucked up. Like, it was a mess, but they still let me in. And then working there, and it's still there, and, like, Lisa Canastracy is still running it. Like, Jesus. Like, I love, that's, like, such a – and I – whenever I go back to New York, which is not that often, I always have to walk by and just kind of check out the triangle in the window. Yeah. Yeah, I like that place. That's, like – Home. There's only three lesbian bars left in New York City at the time of this recording. I mean, God willing, lots of gay bars are dying out right now really? anyway because of anyway, we what just about need, the cubby need hole? more. Is the cubby hole? Cubby hole's still, still going. There. Cubby hole's still going in Ginger's in Brooklyn. But those are the only three like Ooh. physical lesbian bar spaces left in New York. I was, I was gonna say I'm still wondering what my lesbian power move was. Oh, yeah. I know if you think of it, please, you know, is it like did you get the have your did you get the table? Did you you know we need to know. <laughs> Timmy okay, what if you're not it, proud of it? What if it was a... <laughs> okay, you guys, I'm such a dork. I'm so... I should be so much more glamorous, and I'm not. Okay, how about a really poorly aimed, badly timed lesbian power move? In Okay, so remember when Tom and Katie got together and they built this house and it was like this fabulous house and all of a sudden it was like, oh my God, everybody in Hollywood come to the housewarming party, right? We got an invite. 
right? I'm like, oh, well, of course we're going. So we got totally dressed up. We get in a, a car, we go, and we get to the bottom of this driveway. And there's sort of these stragglers of people that are sort of coming down the the steep drive and so you know we get out and we go over and we're sort of looking and we can't tell if these people are talking or what's happening so we kind of just walk past them and we kind of see around the corner the big house in the distance and there's this lovely brownstone type sidewalk that's leading up and it looks like people are start are sort of wandering into the house so we go and we stand sort of where the the pack of people starts gathering to walk up the thing and nobody was moving very fast. They were just like everybody standing around talking and talking to this one, talking to that. And we were like, what the fuck, man? And I had to go to the bathroom really bad. And so we're standing around and we're looking, we're looking and the person I'm with says, come on, let's just go. Come on, come on. She reaches over, grabs my hand and we just start meandering up the side of where all these people are and we're scooching up along the sidewalk and we're going up and around and up. Okay. Mind you, guess who we're pushing past? We're like, Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. Oh, Hey, Oprah, excuse me. Excuse me. Hey, Gail, how's it going? <laughs> excuse me. And we're just literally cutting in front of all these people because it was a line because you were not allowed in the house without a picture with Tom and Katie in the center of their foyer. And as soon as you would get to the door and then you would take this picture, then you could go off to the rest of the party. And so literally people were queued up to stand in line to take the picture with Tom and Katie. And me and Melissa were all like, excuse us, excuse us, excuse us. Pardon us, coming through. Like we did not know there was like class to be had or something at this point. We didn't know there was like fucking decorum and shit. I was like, I gotta go to potty. I mean, it was horrific. And once we got to the very top and we realized what's going on, now we're horrified because now we look back at all the faces and they're all pissed at us like, hey, you can't cut. And clearly we couldn't, but we, and it was just stupid. And then we tried to sneak in the house and that didn't work. Tom caught us and was like, hello. Hi there. It's nice to meet you. Did you want to take a picture? <laughs> like it was right. So then we were like, okay. And then I was so embarrassed. And there's Katie. Last time I saw her, we were dancing on some frog stage somewhere. Right, and right, right. She's the WB. Right? Yes, and of course. We're all like this. And oh now, my god. Right? And now she, that is wild. She's standing there, and he's all standing there. Right. And me and Melissa, we just want to like get into like where the food is or something. And we just literally shoved Oprah and like fucking, oh, it was Re Leah Ramini. I think I was like, excuse me, like ridiculous. It was just, it was awful. And then they realized what we were doing and they tried to sort of help us look a little bit better by that. By that time, everybody was like, the lesbians are here. <laughs> oh my God. It was awful. So then I had to go in and eat a bunch of French fries from Wolfgang Puck because I was like having feelings. That is so cool. <laughs> so bad. That was our last power move. <laughs> you brought the energy that that party needed. You know what I mean? That's what that party needed. Oh well, I yeah. I just imagine you walking in and making like WB eyes at Katie, <laughs> like, "Are you okay? Are you okay?" I was like, I was like, "Good to see you." Blink twice if you need me. Good to see you, huh? <laughs> Girl, oh. I didn't know what to do, but I was like, "Hey, look at us. We cray. Look who we married." Oh. <laughs> 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 we didn't fucking know what we were doing. <laughs> oh my god, that is so cool. Dubba 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 b. Okay, Tammy, your co-star in Dolly Parton's Heartstrings was Sarah Shahi, who famously played Carmen on The L Word. Each of your characters dated Shane. Did you two share Kate Menig war stories while you were on set? Oh my God. Well, first of all, we totally made out because we were like, how did she kiss you? And I was like, how did she kiss you? So we totally, no, I'm kidding. We didn't do that. <laughs> we felt each other. I'm kidding. Um, 
No, you know what's funny? We got, I think we got in the location van at some point. We were pulling out of a hotel and like going off to whatever studio, and she was in like the very back. And as I get in, I was like, hi, hi. We're all sort of meeting each other for the first time at like five o'clock in the, in the morning in the dark. And I just hear Sarah go, hey, L word. We got to share some notes. <laughs> and I was like, oh, L word, what, what? He's hilarious. That is funny. <laughs> Tammy, you had a recurring role on the sitcom That 80s Show. Who is your favorite 80s actress turned lesbian icon? Icon according to who? Me and Anne. Here's your list. Jodie yeah. Foster, Meredith Baxter, Kelly McGillis, Sarah Gilbert, Christy McNichol, and Amanda Beers. Well, listen. Like I said before, I've always enjoyed the people that can't pass. So obviously Christy McNichol. <laughs> <laughs> she was like pinging as a child <laughs> oh my god every time i would i'd like walk by the tv and i'd be like do, do, do. hey oh hey is that buddy let <laughs> me my no no play so funny oh. like, it was ridiculous forget it Kristen mcnichol <clears throat> she still got it tammy the michaels thank you so much this has been an absolute joy Oh, you guys are so sweet. Thank you so much. And I love your show. I've been stalking you now. And then now I'm following you all on Twitter. And it's very exciting. Thank you. Folks. I can't describe to you the joy it brought me to hear about Tammy Lynn making eyes with Katie Holmes and being like, last time I fucking saw her, we were dancing with a frog. <laughs> it was so cool. It was so cool. Also, I'm sure that Tammy, like, Tammy has had this incredible career and is a cool person. And also, like, what she did was crazy like coming out in the, in all of that and with a spotlight on you so i'm sure she doesn't love talking about her marriage to melissa etheridge but i was so into her sharing that story because i felt like oh my gosh of course if you are in a high profile relationship and you get that invite to go to like whatever their housewarming or game night of course she was like we're going which yeah. is exactly <laughs> what tom and katie holmes wanted because that's why they like facilitated this very PR relationship. They wanted to be a spectacle. So people were like, is this real? Is it not? What the fuck? I have to go find if they exist, the step and repeat photos from that party. Can you imagine walking into some fucking like castle mansion in the hills or wherever the fuck they lived and getting in front of like a, an eight by eight <laughs> step and repeat between Katie and Tom. My friend Sarah sent me a text about Katie Holmes this morning. And I was like, she is still a list famous having not worked professionally in years. Good for her because she sat through however many years with Tom Cruise. I mean, she's made it. She came to Broadway a few times. Did she? Yes, yeah, she was in All My Sons, The Revival. Oh, my God. I was imagining her, like, in Chicago, and I was like, she never did Chicago. And then I was like, oh, God, she did Arthur Miller instead. She was also in another <laughs> play, but I don't remember. I didn't see that one because I had already seen her once. She was also with Jamie Foxx for a long time, like, in a secret relationship, I which I was, was into. so into that. I was so into I'm sad that they're over, but, you know, hopefully it was amicable. One of the most intriguing things that we got to talk to her about was being a closeted actor on a set, which I think is something that we're very interested in the sort of history of what it is to be a gay person in Hollywood. And we haven't had that conversation with any of our guests. So for her to be as open as she was with us was so generous. But also you think about that time of being on such a gay show with such a gay person, you know, leading the charge with Ryan Murphy, and then still being very closeted. I felt like she was really open with us. And it was I'm, I'm just so happy for her. I'm, it's terrible that she fucking got outed by somebody on the set of Popular. Fuck that person. But she seems to be in a very good place post all of that. And to get to like live her truth and be a working actor at the same time probably was a huge sense of freedom. Here, here. Folks, we hope you love this interview. And if you do, you'll share it. Put it in those Reddit groups or send them to your friends or your family. Send it to your lesbian mothers. And, you know, make sure you're following. You might know her from wherever you listen to podcasts. Make sure you, you know, give us a few written words. Tell us what you think. How about that? 
might know her from is produced by Ann Rodeman and Damian Bellino. That's us. Make sure you're following us on social media, on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook if you want it. Who cares? I don't know if anybody uses it anymore, but we're there at Damian Bellino and at Rodeman. That's R-O-D-E-M-A-N-N-E. We want to shout out our consultants at Grumpy Entertainment. Thank you to Jason Jude Hill and Daniel Sears. Editing that you hear is also by Daniel Sears. And thanks to Gang for all the excellent music you hear in these episodes. You can find them on iTunes and wherever you listen to music. Who's your favorite late in life lesbian, Damien? Mm, I'm not. Maybe, is it Meredith Baxter Bernie? I don't <laughs> think it is. I mean, does Jodie Foster count? I think Niecy Nash counts. <gasps>